So how do you know that book that you wrote or he received is indeed a revelation? What, what is your you know, objective evidence for that? Because a Christian, whether they're Orthodox or Protestants, they would not accept his claims to be true. So what objective evidence do you share with them or anyone else who's interested to know what your religion is? Do you think religious questions are answered objectively? Yes, has to be. Otherwise you can believe this is God. Yeah. But there is faith, right? There is the faith. No, the, the faith has to be based on solid foundations. If you believe by faith this Coke can is God, then how does one argue with you? Because this is simply, you know, a matter of what kind of faith? Yeah. Not reasonable faith, unreasonable faith. So yeah. faith to be reasonable, it has to be based on solid ground, solid foundations. Otherwise, you can believe in anything, right? Do you agree or, or not? Uh, kind of. I, I think there is both. I think there are both the uh, objective facts and, and also the things that are more mysterious that are okay. revealed by the Holy Spirit. So if you're, if you're talking about things that are unseen, that we cannot use our empirical evidence or even yeah. apply some kind of, you know, intuition there. These are the things, of course, you take in by faith. But these would be secondary to your objective evidence that has molded your faith primarily. And then everything else, for example, have you seen an angel? Uh, no, I haven't either, but I believe in angels, even though I haven't seen them. So my belief in angels is secondary to my believing in God or Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, because I'm a Muslim. So you have to think about what are your primary reasons to believe in the faith, the foundation of faith, and secondary to this, maybe some other things that we believe because they automatically follow from it because not everything can be observable. I mean, I don't believe that you have seen God, have you? I haven't, but I believe in him. I have objective reasons to believe in God. Do you have objective reasons to believe in your faith? That is the question. Oh, sure. yeah. yeah. So what, what, what are the objective, you know, evidences or even solid rational arguments that you can provide to demonstrate the truthfulness of Latter-day Saints? Okay. Well, there is one that I think of immediately. Are you familiar with the Hebraic writing style called Chiasmus? Explain a bit more. I may be familiar a little bit, but... Chiasmus was only discovered in the 1960s to exist in the Old Testament and the New Testament. What is, what is it, that? It is, a, it is a pattern of writing mm. that the ancient Hebrews used okay. where it became a mirror. It's, it's signaled by the, the letter X. It's so a literary novel. It's a literary uh, pattern. Kind of like Shakespeare wrote in a certain literary pattern. Okay. The ancient Hebrews wrote in that pattern. The Book of Mormon was it was discovered in 1960 to have that Hebraic pattern. What language was it written in? It was unknown in Joseph Smith's time. What language was it written in? Reformed Egyptian. No, the, the book that you're referring to, that you foundation of your faith, was Mormon. it written in English? It was first translated in English. And from, from, from what Egyptian. language? And do you have the Egyptian copy? Original? No. Okay. So if you don't have, then how do you compare it that this was the case? Because the text contains the patterns that were unknown at the time of the translation. Within the English text, you're saying this pattern is still there? It is still there. And it is very complex. It, it spans do you want to give me an example of like which page you're referring to in this book? It spans entire chapters. You know, if I want to see a pattern, I, I should be able to observe it objectively and assess it objectively. Okay. Do, you want to, do you want to share an example from it? I could find it. Okay. I don't usually use objective proof because of the spiritual proof being so strong. But there are, there is that one objective truth that I know of, and I'm sure there is others. Well. Yeah. But at this present moment, I mean, I can't assess anything because it's something that has to be postponed for later because you haven't been yeah. able to offer anything yet. So at this very minute, is there anything else that you can offer? Like look, spiritual experiences that you're referring to are seen within most people and communities whether they are Christians, Muslims, Jewish people, 
we, we know that they have experience. Um, so that cannot be the basis of somehow assessing the validity of one's scripture, because it, this applies equally to all the other faith communities. It can for yourself, though. It can be your, your own basis. Yeah, but... Okay. You, you cannot love my wife, but I can love my wife. <laughs> yeah. You can too. You'll be in trouble. Well, what, are some, <laughs> what are some of the objective so, reasons that you have for you? Yeah, so Islam provides falsification tests as one of the ways you can assess the book, whether it's from God or not. Because it tells you if this book is not from God, then this is what you can do to falsify it or to affirm it. Because if you can't falsify it, then the claim that it's from God is still valid. One of the example that gives is, this is such a book that if it was from other than God, then there will be many inconsistencies and discrepancies. Okay? So a book that is written over a period of 23 years, talking about history, science, economics, anthropology, I'm just putting in certain terms here and there, just to tell you, it talks about all aspects of life, from science to, you know, you know, morality and ethics, laws, you name it. It's a comprehensive book. And yet, it asks you, if it wasn't from God, you should find within it inconsistencies. Because what we see is, when people write, when they are not inspired by God or appointed by God to be a prophet and a messenger, or a spokesperson or an agent of God, they are actually fraudulent imposters, fake individuals who are trying to go by saying, I have received revelation when they haven't. So what they will produce effectively is what is the product of their own learning and experience and what is the knowledge and experience are around them at that time. So they would make, of course, the information content which is current at that time, which they thought is true, and real and factual but it may be the case later on now with our advancements of science technology and knowledge we would know that it's not true if somebody said the earth was flat for example back then at one point people didn't have a problem with that they thought that was it it's a scientific consensus but later on with our kind of technology when we move outside the earth step outside the earth and we can orbit around the earth and just to see how the earth is we would say that person who said the earth was flat was mistaken. So this is how you can falsify that person's statement saying the earth is flat. So the Quran offers you this kind of falsification test in which you can, you can, you can, okay. Thank you, thank you. He's a heckler. Do you know what a heckler in speaker's corner? A heckler is when there's a conversation going, thank you. When is the conversation going? <laughs> they cannot have a meaningful discussion themselves, but they love to interrupt and divert the topic to something, whatever they have in mind. Anyways, you can ignore him. <laughs> That's what I mean. So the Quran talks about these inconsistencies. When I die, not not to meet you in heaven and meet Muslim if they go in there. Sure, prefer your own self. That's probably better and more effective. They play you. America is. No, no, it's probably met, more better for you to pray for your own yeah, self, right? Don't rely on someone else and beg them for their prayers, right? Who is in charge of your religion? Thank you. Is right. are, are they your enemy, as you said? America and Israel. Okay, I'm more interested in speaking to you, if you don't mind. Yeah, Thank you. Whatever. Right. Good luck. And the Western, they are playing you. Right, right. right. You're okay. Muslim, you are Asian, you are, and, you know, they give you mosques, they play you, and they use it. The arguments you have made yeah. So, yeah. are similar to those I hear of the Bible. Where does the Bible even claim? Where does the Bible even make that claim? Where does the Bible make the claim? Even make that claim? John 1, in the beginning was the Word. Yeah. That's that's the claim that the Word is God. And so this, this book... No, the is, book about contradictions and inconsistencies and discrepancies. Where does the book make that claim? I'm just telling you that circular argument that the book argues the book is true is also no, no. made by those of the Bible. They, the Bible they say the same does the Bible say, argument. from what you know, that this book is free from inconsistencies? Does because if it says so, we can test it. It has to make a claim. If a book says this book is from God, we can then test it whether it's from God or not. Like Harry Potter, the books, 
by this author, Harry Potter and the series of that book. Yeah. If it doesn't say it's from God, I don't have to even test and assess it's from God or not. The Quran says it, it is from God. The Quran says it's from God and it says it is free from inconsistencies. And thus it, and thus it is. No, what I'm saying is it's a falsification test that it offers to falsify that book if it's from God. Because if you think about it, if it wasn't if it wasn't from God, we expect it to contain inconsistencies, discrepancies. So when we find, for example, to give you an example of the, the not not the, um, the the book of Mormon, but the book that the Jewish Christian believes, the Old and the New Testament, you would see the theologically it contradicts in the very essence of the message. For example, there's a book called Ezekiel, I'm sure you're familiar with. Ezekiel chapter 18, the whole chapter is one thesis. It's all about how doesn't matter whatever you do, your sins does not transmit to next generation, your son or your grandson and so on, your next generation offspring. If you're a wicked person, your son is not going to be punished for your wickedness. Your son is going to be responsible for his own goodness or badness. So your son may be a good person and you're a wicked person. So your son would not die and be punished because of your wickedness. The whole chapter 18 is actually a refutation of the belief one people had is, oh, God actually takes people to task and account for so many generations. Like your, you did something wrong, your children and your generations to follow, they are going to be all punished for that. Just like the Christian and the Jewish theology or, or the understanding that because of Adam and Eve, what they've done, their action is now being what? Taken into the shoulders of all the other people who believe in that religion and they are guilty of the crime of what Adam and Eve did. So Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. It was a crime in the sight of God. This crime is now also imputed on the children of Adam, which they are guilty. And they will also die because of what they have done. We consider that to be unjust, but that's not the point I'm making. I'm simply saying the theology about that, you know, children are blamed or accountable for their fathers and forefathers. Ezekiel says no. Look into other books of the Bible, New Testament and the Old Testament which gives you the indication, even to the third or fourth generation, you are blamed, you are guilty. So theologically, this is the inconsistency of the message. If that is a one book, but if I consider that these are different authors writing about different, in book for different people, different, then of course you can explain that, okay, no wonder the other author disagrees with this. But the Christian Dom, Christianity, believes in all of those books to be from God. And yet, this is the discrepancy or inconsistency or contradiction in the theology. When it comes to the Quran, so you can find out whether it's a theology or morality or ethics, science, whether it could be prophecies or history. You need to just go and find something in, inconsistent. That's what the Quran is saying. Because if it wasn't from God, this is what we expect, like we expect in other books from history. So this is one example in which Quran offers. People can falsify this book. Another example, which you may be familiar with, because the, your founder was familiar with this, because the Quran came 1400 years ago, and Joseph Smith was in the Middle Ages, right? So he was familiar with the Quranic challenge, in which the Quran challenged people to produce a chapter like the Quran, imitate a chapter like the Quran. So either you do a chapter or 10 chapters, they're called Surah in the Quran, or a whole book consisting of 114 chapters. It's up to you whether you want to do a whole book or 10 chapters or one chapter. So the Quran seems to be quite flexible and um, lenient on the people who cannot do that. And not only that, it says, if you can't do it yourself, you can go and seek help and support from others besides God to imitate a chapter. So 1444 years is almost gone. People, they didn't just simply ignore this challenge, they tried to imitate it. There are many recorded in historical accounts in which they failed to even say I'm doing something before they could do it because they didn't realize it's not something that's doable. Others did try imitating it. And the products that have come down to us can be easily analyzed by the literary critics and they can easily say that this is laughable. Because the Quran, even to this day, 
is the most eloquent book in the Arabic language from its inception. The Arabs never had a book in their, in, in, when, when the Quran was revealed to them. But yet, even to this day, the eloquence of the Quran is uncontested, undisputable, even by the academic, Western academic scholarship. But of course, I am not somehow using this as an argument that, oh, look, what the academic scholarship say. It, the Quran needs to be judged on its own merit and understood and appreciated by the people of knowledge and expertise on the Quran. So when we look at what is the exact challenge of the Quran is to imitate its style, the stylistics of the Quran. And the way it is, you know, produced or, you know, it brought about this genre of, of the Quranic literature is something that people know that it's not imitable. But that's a linguistic challenge which may, may not be easy to understand if you are not fluent in Arabic or even in uh, knowledgeable uh, and, and have much understanding of literature. So the, the two main arguments that the Quran provides are actually falsification tests. There are other falsification tests in which Quran says, you did not know this before, for example. Now imagine now, you set up. I knew it. So when it was revealed to the people in which there were the Arabs around them, the Arab pagan Arabs who worship idols, there were some pockets of Jews and Christians in, in, in Medina, for example. And the neighboring countries, so you had the Byzantine Empire and you have the Persian Empire. When Muslims went along, and of course, there's interactions. They could have easily said, but I knew it. So it's false. They could have easily falsified it. Let me give you an example in which there was so much chance, about 11 years to falsify the book. In one of the chapters of the Quran, Quran talks about a particular individual by the nickname of Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was so, uh, like, in terms of how his interaction with the Muslims, he's like an enemy of Islam, he doesn't want Islam to even to be propagated and so on, he wanted to destroy Islam, right? So the Quran simply, the author is God, from his, you know, wisdom and knowledge, he just informed of the unseen, the fate of Abu Lahab. You know, we don't know our fate. The land we're going to die, the time we're going to die, no one knows. It's in the hands of God. So the, the author of the Quran, the creator of our universe, just simply said Abu Lahab and his wicked wife, they will both, both will be burnt in hellfire, carrying woods and so on in hellfire. So it gave the actual, you know, future outcome of what's going to happen to them later because of their disbelief. Now imagine if I, you and I were Abu Lahab, I would say, golden opportunity to destroy Islam. I would simply say, oh Prophet, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. What it means is, I be a witness that there is no God worthy of worship. And I be a witness, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. This is how one becomes Muslim, by testifying and declaring. So that testimony would have been publicly accepted that he's now a Muslim. And the fate of a Muslim is not hellfire. He would have simply destroyed Islam. Even though he could have done this as an outward saying, as a hypocrite. Inside he doesn't believe anything, but outwards he's saying, I'm a Muslim. There are many hypocrites like that. They could have done that. Abu Lahab had 10, 11 years to do that. And yet he never did these things. So this was an opportunity in which he could have falsified the whole Quran. We have to go, but where are you from? Um, but not f far from here, but, but that's... Were you born here in London? Oh, you, I'm from the Indian subcontinent. Okay. So, you know, you have Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, all this area. Um, how about yourself? You're from the States? Yes, Utah. From Utah. Utah. Yeah. What's your name? Chris. Rob. Chris, and yours? David. David, I'm Mansoor. Mansoor? It's a pleasure speaking to you. If you have to go, yes. that's fine. Yes. But um, do um, look into the Quran, look into what the Quran has to say. Because as I said, we are engaging in these this, this discussions in a, in a manner so that we can learn from each other, so that maybe you know, if our faith is something that we haven't finally accepted as a true reality, we can adopt the reality, the truth. Because if the truth was in, say, a religion called Trunka Wunka, we should follow that religion if that was the truth. Do you see my point? So if the religion, if the truth is in Islam, we should be open to, uh, for that, for acceptance. Okay, what are your names? Thank you. Pleasure speaking to you. You take care. Okay, bye-bye.